Good morning, Life Church. Stay tuned. The Sunday experience is about to begin. If you're a guest with us today, we would love to connect with you. And an easy way to do that is to download the Life Church Emporia app from iTunes or Google Play and fill out the digital connection card where it says new here. If you haven't been receiving our emails, Life Church, please let us know by emailing lifechurch at lifechurchemporia.com. Now stay tuned, the Sunday experience is about to begin. We have a number of ways that you can connect this week and a great place to find that information is by checking the digital bulletin on the Life Church app. You can also find information about what's going on on our Facebook as well as our Instagram accounts. Stay tuned, the Sunday experience is about to begin. Life Church, thank you so much for your faithfulness in giving. Because you've been faithful, we've been able to continue to support ministries and missionaries at home and around the globe. If you'd like more information on giving, you can go to lifechurchemporia.com slash give. If you want to give through text, that number is 620-236-6789. If you've downloaded the app, you can find the information on giving on the give tile. And if you're in the building, you can find envelopes and buckets next to each door. If you have any questions about giving, please contact Sarah Jenick. Now stay tuned, the Sunday experience is about to begin.
morning. Thank you, Presley. I see you. All right, let's all stand together this morning. Let's get those. It's a, it's, you guys are really quiet today. You guys know what happens when you're really quiet. You get yelled at a lot, right? So everyone, I'm going to try this. Uh, I was going to try it. I'm not. So you're going to have to just wonder what I was talking about. But uh, tell your neighbor hi from your distance. Hi, it's good to see you. Aren't you glad you're at church today? Sometimes it's fun when there's a smaller crowd, right? You know, right? Let's welcome the Lord here because he's here with us. Amen. Father God, we love you. We invite you today to come and have your way in us. Come and do what you want to do in our hearts and in our minds and in our lives today. We welcome you here. We welcome you to have your way in and through us today. Amen. Amen. We're going to worship you with all that we have today.
forward to that day when we leave all of this world behind to be face to face with you. What a day that will be. Amen. Amen. Something I felt impressed to share, but I avoided. But it's still there, you know. Sometimes you avoid it and it goes away, right? Um, I was teaching my son first grade. <laughs> First grade phonics, right? This is important. We all need to learn this. This is important. Uh, but we do a Christian curriculum, and we were talking about sheep and the shepherd. And our curriculum brought in the fact that the shepherd goes out early in the morning, and wherever the sheep are, wherever they are in this story, they call like mesa areas, uh, tables. And the shepherd will go out before before he lets the sheep come with him and he goes out and he looks around to make sure that there's no poisonous plants or bad things for the sheep and he prepares the table for the sheep and ever since that day I'm like Jesus goes out before us when we're babies and he'll go and pick out the things that maybe might cause us to fall away right how kind of him to go before us and prepare a table day after day after day for all of the days of our lives he prepares a table for us I just I loved that imagery he's the good shepherd and how fitting I mean who knew what hard work shepherds have to do it's not just an easy I know it's a bat it's a terrible right were they like shunned they were the the low of the low and they do all this hard work for their people their sheep aren't you glad Jesus does that for you Aren't we glad? So thank you, Jesus. I don't know. Now I feel dumb after I shared that. But Lord, I pray that you will use that in someone's life today. The com it kind of goes along with from last week, talking about you keeping us and preparing us. And we don't have to worry about what's going to come. Because Jesus, you go before us. You prepare a table for us. We don't have to worry that we won't be provided for because you never fail us. So thank you for that promise. Thank you for being, along with being the king of kings, along with being the lamb that was slain, you are also the good shepherd. How you do all these things, we'll never understand it. But you do. And you take care of us better than any of us could take care of ourselves. So thank you for doing that. We love you. Let's just lift our voices up. Just tell them thank you this morning. We worship you, Jesus. We say thank you for being our savior. Thank you for being our good father. Thank you for being the shepherd that goes before us and prepares a table for us, Jesus. Thank you that you are all the things that we need. And without you, we would need everything. And with you, we need nothing. Everything that we have need of is found in you, Jesus. Even though we don't understand how you do it, you are faithful to do it every time. And for that, we will give you praise and glory and honor. We'll look forward to the day when, when we see you and all that can come out is holy, 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 holy is the Lord. Holy, 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 holy are you, Lord. Great in glory, great in power you are. You are worthy. Father God, I pray that you are pleased with what we offered you today. God, I pray that you continue to move in this service, move in these people move through our pastor we want to be changed by you we want to grow in you we want to know you better we want to be more like you we want to be ready for whatever's going to come so God may we be that today may you draw us closer to you today in Jesus name we pray amen you Amen. How many of you believe in the power of prayer? I mean, I, I say this this morning because uh, I, I don't, we don't do this real often on Sundays, but I just sent an email out just a moment ago. Uh, Mary Cox fell and broke her uh, hip, 
And can we can we right now? I just believe in the power of prayer. How many of you believe in the power of prayer? I asked that question. Uh, we're, that she's having surgery um, as we speak, um, or was having surgery as we speak, and so uh, just want to pray for her right now. Can we do that, Lord God? Lord, you see um, Mary right now. Um, Lord, you've preserved her. <laughs> you're 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 amazing, God. You you work in powerful ways, and this morning. In faith, just like little kids, we ask you to heal her body and touch her and make things right. And uh, we love you and thank you for it. Thank you, God. Guide that surgeon's hand, whatever is necessary there. God, bring the right thing about in her life right now in Jesus' name. We thank you. Hallelujah. You are so good, God. We'll, We'll be careful to thank you for it too, God. Thank you in advance, in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, this morning, um, I, I, we want to welcome you to Life Church. Those of you who are guests, we're so glad you're here. Um, if you have your phone, your tablet, or your actual Bible, I want you to turn with me to Romans chapter 5, verse 12. And this morning's one, one uh, verse long this morning. Um, if you have your Actually, if you don't have the Life Church app, it would be a very helpful thing for you uh, in becoming a student of the Word, um, because the app has the ability to follow along with notes, especially we as we hit some of the more technical parts. Like today, I say this because the app notes. I just want you to know something. I I just happen to believe that God's people, in terms of biblical foundation, have have been really honestly. A lot of people just want to kind of like, well, you know, we read over the scriptures and we don't, the, the people of God don't really get into the technical stuff. Let me just tell you something. I just believe you guys are that smart. I believe we have a, a, a people who can get it. And so because of that, um, we are going to be hitting more technical parts. Today is a, a little more technical part. I think it, uh, the way we've arranged it, I think you'll be able to, to keep up with it. Um, you'll be able to retain your thoughts with your app. Um, maybe for future things as you study in Romans, uh, where I believe that many of these concepts will begin to explode in your spirit. So um, so this morning, uh, we come to a very vital passage, and, and this is a passage that explains why the world is the way it is. I mean, it, we, we come to the, the passage uh, of verse 12, Romans 5, 12. Why do people die? I mean, why is there disease? Why is there sickness? Why does it seem like life at its core, is broken. So it's this verse where Paul answers those questions and and he lets us know that the world's condition in life are all the results of the actions of a man by the name of Adam. And just so you understand, he's not, listen, I say this because this morning as we look at this, when we see Paul's words, he's not necessarily telling us about Adam, but he uses this contrast and comparison using Adam and the reign of sin to help us understand the magnitude and the permeated effect of Jesus Christ and his reign of grace. And the, the whole point of this is that you, would, you, you have to really understand Adam to understand Christ. I mean, in fact, that, that this is something that would have been readily understood by previous generations to us. I mean, in fact, terminology that relates Christ um, uh, to Adam would have been sung in the Christmas carols. Some of you recognize some of the carols that we sing at Christmas time, particularly ones like Hark the Herald Angels Sing, Glory to the Newborn King. Most hymnals have three verses of that song, uh, but there are actually two additional verses. I want to show you just a piece of one of those real quickly. Adam's likeness, Lord, efface. Stamp thine image in its place. Second Adam from above, reinstate us in thy love. In other words, the, the idea of Christ and Adam in so many ways is being lost. I mean, there's a corollary there, an understanding there, because our relationship to Adam becomes the foundation for our understanding of our relationship to Christ. And this has been lost. And, and this goes back to Romans again. And not only that, but it even goes back to the fall that we have recorded in Genesis 1. This passage then, it begins to tell us about the kingdom of Adam. This passage then also begins to tell us also about the kingdom of Christ. And again, Paul is writing this because what happens is, is he wants us, particularly as followers of Jesus Christ, to understand that. 
to, 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 to understand that relationship. So uh, a fantastic way to illustrate Romans chapter 5, verse 12, I want you to see this, is to understand the background that Paul uh, would have been writing uh, Romans to us in. Uh, it's the turbulent history of ancient um, Rome produced more tormentous, I mean, I say this because it was such a, a horrible time period, AD 69. Nero, how many of you ever heard that name? Raise your hand. Nero, uh, having contrived to uh, <laughs> alienate practically everybody in his life um, with his behavior, his personality, his policies, finally loses his nerve and brings his shameful life to an embarrassing end. Remember, this is the guy who used Christians as the scapegoat for the great fire of Rome that he was accused, he was accused of starting it himself. So he burned Christians alive. This is that same guy. So his suicidal death literally terminated a dynasty, though. And so uh, the moment that happened, I mean, a, a great power struggle ensued. And you have the, the armies of Rome, the Senate of Rome, and the patrician families of Rome, the, the results of which uh, were, was a whole lot of conspiring a whole lot of tyranny, a whole lot of murder, uh, which ended around AD 69, the title of which in that period of time was this title right here, the year of the four emperors. So literally, I mean, uh, you, you have this, you have this, this battle. Well, Paul, as he's writing Romans chapter 5, in the unfolding story of God's dealing with mankind in Romans 5, now turns his attention to another struggle. I mean, he's looking at it from the perspective, okay, oh, when we look at Rome, we look at this power struggle, but there was a, a cosmic struggle as, as well, if you will, uh, of four cosmic monarchs, if you could say it that way. I mean, the four cosmic monarchs, pole positioning for supremacy were these four things, sin and death and grace and life. Later, you'll, you'll notice, uh, uh, I'm not saying today necessarily, but later on in verses 12 through 21, I mean, you're going to see the word reign appear like four different times. Now, before we would jump into the actual text, that there's a little bit of groundwork that ha would help us clarify to understand this as we look at this verse. A lot of people want to oversimplify and try to make, and let me just tell you something. Is the gospel simple in its, in its purest form? Absolutely it is. But, but the thing is, is what people fail to do sometimes is we, we, we want to water ski over things. And the thing is, is there is such depth in just a verse like verse 12. I mean, so, so before we jump into this, there, there's a little bit of groundwork. And I want you to see this. It's a clarifying language. It's really three words to help us clarify. The first one is this, the word therefore. Everybody say the word therefore. Whenever you see a therefore... You always want to know what it's there for. That's a, kind of a joke, but it's always pointing us back to what we've already seen before. So it's already been said. So remember back Romans chapter 5, verse 10. You can look back and you can see this. For, for if while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, much more, now that we are reconciled, shall we be saved by his life. And remember, here's, here's what Paul was saying. If we were made friends with God, that's what reconciled means. I mean, how much more, now that we are friends of God, will we be saved in his life? I mean, so by, it, it's an unfortunate translation if you look at it um, by instead of in. Both the NASB and the ESB put, put by. Unfortunately, on this one, which normally they are both great, in is a better term. And here's why. What happened to him, Christ, is viewed from God's standpoint as if it happened to you and me. I look at this, I mean, in fact, Galatians chapter 2, verse 20, he says it this way, I am, how many of you remember this verse? I am crucified with Christ, Paul says that. So, so uh, was I really crucified? Was I actually crucified? No. But, but when I put my faith in Christ, what he did, since I'm in him, it's now as if I did it. I mean, how many of you are picking up what I'm laying down? I'm, I'm, I'm trying to explain this. How many of you understand what I'm saying? Uh, raise your hand. Okay, so, so another example, another place in this would be Ephesians chapter 2, verses 5 and 6. God, when we were dead in our trespasses, when we were spiritually dead, that means that we were unable to respond to God. We didn't have the ability to do so. He made us alive with Christ. In other words, when Christ was resurrected, I mean, when I put my faith in Christ, it's as if I was resurrected with him. 
And just as he ascended, I mean, it's, it's as if I've literally ascended with him into the heavenlies, and then watch this, and he raised us up with him. Now it's, it's not talking future. Literally, Paul's like, we're seated with him right now in heavenly places, and seated us with him in the heavenly places in, in Christ Jesus. Well, what's happened to him? It's as if it's happened to you and me. What's happened to Christ is as this has happened to us. And so remember, again, from several weeks back, I mean, th- there really are a couple of different categories of people. If you look at it, I mean, you, you got those who are under grace, uh, literally because they received the free gift of salvation through Jesus Christ. And then you also have those that are literally still under wrath. Those who remained under the wrath of God because they are facing judgment. That's why we took time to explain that, that, that God's not just waking up angry. He's not just getting up out of bed in the morning and just he's, he's cranky. He's, he's actually actively opposed to every kind of evil and evil people. And he's not just neutral concerning evil. Rather, he judges it. And so evil man is facing judgment and the wrath of God remains on him, John 3.36. And, and so it, it wouldn't just be if you end up in hell that you're under wrath. Literally, ra- rather it remains on you if you don't know Jesus. In fact, not only are there two categories of people, I would also say to you, and I think this is really important right now, and it really applies in the culture we sit in right now, uh, not only are there two categories of people, but I would also say to you that there are two races of people. I mean, now, now I know if we use the word race, instantly uh, it can be a hot button for those outside the church. I understand that, that sometimes even in the church that that can be a hot button. I understand that that word is a politically and socially charged word, but I use it because it's actually very, very important biblically for you to understand this and not say stupid things on Facebook. Can I just say that? I mean, so, because if you don't understand how God views things, you can be really, really misled. You can say a lot of dumb stuff, not just by the media, but, but even by our society itself. I would suggest that sometimes in highlighting diversity, we're creating division instead of togetherness. <laughs> Whereas if we actually had a little bit of biblical understanding, we'd actually have real unity, not this fake garbage that we see around right now. So you may say, well, what do, you, what do you mean? Well, in terms of humanity, outside of Christ, we're all one race, one person. We all link back to this one man. We're, we're all the same race. In fact, let me just show you Acts chapter 17, verse 26. says this, and this is Paul preaching to the Greeks in Athens, and he says this, and he, who is he? Well, it's God. He, God made from one man every nation of mankind to live on all the face of the earth. So, so we, we all come from one man. So, so there is this, this first race of people, uh, the race of Adam, if you will, but now through faith in Jesus Christ, and some of us get really excited about this, there is a new humanity. There is a new uh, humanity. So, th- so we have the race of Christ. So you're either in Adam's race or you're in Christ's race. That's how God sees it. Now, there's a second word I want to point out to you, and that's the word one. And this, is a, this, is, this word is used if you go through verses 12 through 19, which we're not going through that entire thing this morning. But understand this. If you look through this, this actual passage, you're going to look down in your Bible, and you're going to see the word one used 11 different times. And by the way, this is, this is super critical that you and I understand this when it comes to telling people about the Lord because Paul is, Paul is going to de- demonstrate for us the impact that one person had on the human race. He's going, to, he's going to show us one person did something and it actually affected every single human being that would ever live. It affected all of humanity. And you'll see it here in a minute. He says one over and over again down through these verses. Now, Here's a third word I want to show you to help clarify this morning what we're looking at, and that's the word rain. Everybody say rain. I know. Rain, rain, go away. Please come back some other day. Some of you, if the rain went away, then it would be too pretty for you to be at church. Then you wouldn't be here, so I'm glad for the rain. So I'm just kidding. But anyway, th- this word appears five times, the word rain, R-E-I-G-N, in, different, in three different verses. You can see them here on the screen. Um, death rain, sin rain, rain in, in, in life. You look at verse 17 and then down in 21 again. Uh, so, so death rain, if you don't believe it, just read the paper. <laughs> Every day, here's the deal, people die. 
I mean, why does, why does death reign? Let me just say this, because sin reigns. I mean, so, 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 so death reign, verse 21. Sin reign, but, but you and I, because of what Jesus did, we can, verse 17, we can reign in life. I mean, and Jesus came that, verse 21, grace also might reign. This, this one man, Adam, sinned, and now death and sin reign. But this one man, Christ, you look at this, he died for our sin, and when you put your faith in him, you move into a whole different kingdom, you move into a whole different dominion. How many of you are excited about this? You move into a whole different monarch system, you move into a whole different ethic, and that ethic, that force, that power is grace. How many of you are thankful for grace this morning? Grace reigns. So, so let, let's look at it now, verse, verse 12. Therefore, just as sin came into the world through one man, and death through sin. And so death spread to all men because all sinned. This word, this word, I, I gotta say this because this is, this is one of the most important verses in the Bible from the standpoint of theology. I mean, if you don't get this verse right, virtually <laughs> there can be a splintering effect in terms of our theological development and our understanding of a myriad of other issues in the Bible. Some, t- some people say, well, one verse. I mean, it's just one verse. I mean, really, Pastor? I mean, come on. I mean, is one verse really that important? Yes, it can affect things later on. It can affect things if you don't interpret this right, if you don't get this right. Again, this is where people get way off in so many other biblical issues if they do not understand this. So as we look at it, what I'm going to do, I'm going to break it down. Um, how, many of you, when, how many of you have ever ridden a bicycle without any handlebars before? Raise your, raise your hand. How many of you used to ride with no hands? Raise your hand high. Okay, I, I'm not going to do that to you. I'm going to give you some handlebars because it's important we have handlebars so we can actually hang on, right, when you're actually going through a sermon. So the handlebars, I got three of them, and I know that there's normally two handlebars, but this is a sermon. You've got to have a three-point sermon, right? So some of you, if you're going to have a handlebar, you've got to make sure you have But anyway, the handlebars are real simple. It's actually the verse itself. And the first one is this. The first handlebar, the first thing for you to grab a hold of so we can kind of follow along is sin entered the world through one man. I mean, why in the world, why is the world the way it is? I mean, sin entered the world through one man. Why is there death? Sin entered the world through one man. Why do we have sorrow? Sin entered, sin entered the world through one man. Why is life so broken? sin into the world through one man. And in order to get an understanding of how that actually works, we need to go back and we need to see where that actually takes place. And thankfully, I'm just going to say this, how many of you are thankful that God recorded what actually took place in Genesis chapter 1, uh, chapter 2, and chapter 3? I'm very thankful for that so we can see it. But let's look at it, verse 1, or excuse me, chapter 1, verse 27. So God created man in his own image, in the image of God he created him. How many of you recognize this verse? Male and female, he created him. Notice God's, God creates one man in the beginning, and then he creates a female. And watch what he does, verse 28. And God blessed them, and God said to them, Be fruitful and multiply. And then I want you to watch this. And fill the earth and subdue it. In other words, govern or lead it. Have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the, the birds of the, the heavens and over every living thing that moves on the, on the earth. God creates one man and one woman, puts them on the earth, and he says, listen, this is your kingdom. This is where you'll reign. And, and I'm asking, I'm, I'm actually asking you uh, and tasking you, if you will, with rulership. And you will be the sovereigns and, and the king and the queens of this creation. Now, I want to go back a few verses in verse 15. The Lord took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to work it and keep it. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, You may surely eat of every tree of the garden, verse 17, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat. For in the day that you eat of it, you shall surely die. Just, just one command. Just one command, one very, very simple command. All Adam and had, Eve had to do was obey one command. Maybe you'd say, well, why is that? I mean, is that random and, and you know, just kind of whimsical on God's part? I mean, he just wants to just show his power by saying, hey, you know, leave that alone. I mean, no, no God is God. And, sin, and God is simply saying, listen, I'm simply asking you to demonstrate your submission to me. 
I'm simply asking you uh, to show reverence for me. I'm asking you uh, in your worship of me, and all I'm asking is one thing, and, and, and it's not really going to be all that complicated, Adam and Eve. Listen, there are a lot of trees. There are, there's a lot of beauty. There's a whole lot of great food in this garden. All you have to do is don't eat from that one tree. And it would be out of their reverence for God that they would do that, that they would eat from that. Listen, that they, they, they wouldn't eat from that tree uh, recognizing that there was a God who was over them because in every other way, I, I say this because a lot of times we have people that will say, well, God is such a, he's so mean. And listen, they were ruling, they could have whatever they want except for that tree. So they could do whatever they wanted. I mean, so, so you can't look at this as some unfair, restrictive, uh, out-of-touch command on God's part. I mean, in fact, it's a very, very generous command. In fact, Genesis chapter 3, Now the serpent was more crafty than any other beast of the field that the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, Did, did God actually say? Isn't that how Satan works? You shall not eat of the, any tree in the garden. The serpent, he's, he's now energized, now infiltrated by Satan, whom in other parts of Scripture is known as the serpent as a result of this passage. Satan comes because, listen, he comes to steal, he comes to steal, he comes to kill, he comes to steal, and he comes to destroy. And wanting to destroy this beautiful creation, wanting to mar everything God has done, wanting to introduce something that will absolutely devastate humanity he comes to the woman and he says, did God really say that? I mean, which gives us insight into how the enemy of our souls works. I mean, so Satan is like, you know, I can't really picture of God of love saying that to you. I mean, I can't really, I mean, can you? I mean, can you see a God of love saying something like that? I'm, don't eat of that tree. I mean, Satan is like, how restrictive is that? I mean, really, Eve, I mean, how narrow-minded must God be then? I mean, how, how simple must he be? Come on, what's the big deal? I mean, listen, a tree's a tree, right? I mean, shouldn't a tree just be a tree? I mean, doesn't God want you to be happy? How many of you, this, this sounds familiar in our culture today. Doesn't God want you to be happy? I mean, I think he's just holding good stuff from you because he wants to control you. Listen, and the woman said to the serpent, verse 2, we may eat of the tree of the fruit of the trees in the garden, but God said, you shall not eat of the fruit of the tree that is in the midst of the garden, neither shall you touch it lest you die. But the serpent said to the woman, God's lying. <laughs> God's lying. <laughs> he's lying. I mean, you will not surely die. For God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be open and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. God just doesn't want you to be able to do what you want. How confining is he on you? How, how, how hard is hard-nosed is God? I mean, so look at verse 6. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that was the light to the eyes, and that the tree was so to be desired um, to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate. She also gave some to her husband who was with her, and he ate. And listen, folks, that's the fall of mankind. When we, when, we, when we look at this, and that's the fall of mankind. God gave Adam one command, and it's the only thing Adam had to do to stay in that place of submission to God. Everything else that Adam wanted to do, he would have been able to do it. But Adam, listen, he, he chooses not to obey God. But he, he chooses to disobey the only command God gives him. And when he did that, can I just tell you something? This is our subject this morning. Something so cataclysmic, something so horrible, something so terrible beyond our ability to even sometimes grab a hold of in that moment happened. And really, sometimes we don't realize the consequences of sin. I mean, God knows what they are. But something happened that was so horrible beyond any of our ability to comprehend and imagine. Romans 5.12, look at it. Therefore, just as sin came into. It also could read this way. And you, look at your, you look at the original language there, and, and there's other words that help us to understand really kind of what this sin really did. It says sin came into, but just another way to, to read it might be sin invaded the world. Or just as sin broke into the world. Or just as sin came rushing into the world, the world through one man. 
I want you to notice something because the way Paul writes this, I think it's very, very instructive to us to help us to understand, to see the destructive nature of sin. Can I just tell you something? The sin that you think is like, oh, it's, no really, it's really no big deal. Can I just tell you how messed up that thought is? I mean, it's so destructive. Notice how Paul personifies sin. I mean, he pictures sin as actually doing something. Literally, sin. What did it do? Well, it came in. It busted onto the scene, if you will. Later, verse 21, he'll say, sin reigned. What does Paul mean by that? I mean, sin just isn't just the fact. Can I just tell you, sin is not just the fact that you and I did something wrong. That's not, that's not necessarily what sin is. If we limit it to that, we don't understand sin. You know, we're, it's kind of the idea. How many of you this week, you sinned, and you're like, man, anybody? Okay, this is a real church. The rest of you are aligned, so you just sinned just now. So how many of you, you sinned? You, you, you failed. You had a, anybody have an angry thought or a bad thought, or you wanted to, like, hurt somebody? How many of you wanted to hurt somebody? Okay. How many of you are the person next to you? Don't raise your hand. Okay. Just, <laughs> you guys, some of you raised your hand. That's bad. We need to have a prayer meeting after, but... You know, you know, it, it's not just as simple as saying, oh, oops, I sinned, oh, well. <laughs> Let me just say, we err if we relegate sin only to that kind of understanding. Sin is something more than you and I do. Sin is a force. It, 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 it comes in and it rains. It permeates, it dominates, if you will. It controls. Sin is powerful. Sin is deadly. Sin is, can I just say this? Because this is a word we use in our culture and I don't think we really understand. Sin is so cancerous beyond our understanding of cancer. It simply dominates and controls and it's active and it does things and it doesn't do nice things. Listen, look at it again, verse 12. Therefore, just as sin came, invaded into the world, how? Through one man. When one man, Adam, sinned, Sin invaded the world. Adam's sin and, 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 and the corruption of sin entered the world in general. So, so much so that, I mean, what, that, that what happens is, is that it doesn't just affect people, but it actually affects creation. I, how many of you have heard this verse where, where Paul in Romans chapter 8, he, he says that all of creation, what does it do? It, it groans. Anybody ever heard that language? Creation, it groans. Well, in other words, it's trying to do, creation is, creation is trying to do what it was originally created to do, but it can't quite do it. And I say this, and someone might say, well, but it's so beautiful and it's so wonderful, even in its broken down state. I mean, it reflects the glory and the grandeur of God. And listen, you would not be wrong in saying that, but it's still very frustrated, creation is. Why? Because of sin. Sin invaded creation in general, and it it invaded humankind in particular, and sin invaded Adam, and it got into his DNA, and Adam has passed it down, just like Adam would pass down your ears and your nose. Some of you like, I'm I'm just saying, I'm not making fun of your ears or your nose. I'm just saying, we all come from Adam. I'm just saying. So just like he's passed down hair, hands, some of you with more hair, some of you with less hair. I mean, I'm just saying, he's also passed down this devastating, this permeating, this corrupting thing called sin. Therefore, just as sin came into the world through one man. I want you to see the second point. Here's your second handlebar. I know there's normally only two, but we have three, remember. Death entered the world through sin. One man sins... And instantly, death becomes a reality. Just so you understand, this would be, I I, I don't know if we get this. This would be absolutely, unbelievably shocking for a listener to hear of someone sitting in the garden and to experience what the garden would have been like. I mean, just so you understand, this would be so shocking. This would be so massive in its ramifications for us. Notice Romans 5.12 again. Therefore, just as sin came into the world through one man and... Notice the underlined part, and death through sin. Remember, remember what God had said in Genesis chapter 2, verse 17, and some of you are going to be like, oh yeah, I know exactly what that says. No, most of us probably don't recognize a verse you know, just like that. But, but it says, of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you shall not eat. For the day that you eat it, 
you shall surely die, God said. That, that verse not only tells us that death came into the world through sin, but when you begin to think through the ramifications of that, implied in that statement is the fact that man was never created to die. I mean, let me put it this way. Death is unnatural to people. I mean, you know, you, you were never meant to die. What? I, I, I wasn't taught that. I'm just telling you, biblically, you were never meant to die. I mean, that was never God's plan. God did not design a human being to die. Some of you are like, really? I mean, <laughs> really? That's, that's real? Yeah, that's very real. I mean, in fact, let me just say that this. You know, how many of you have heard the circle of life? I mean, you know what I'm talking about? I, I'm trying to remember the, the movie. Lion King, yeah. Okay, I could only remember the, the words of the song, and I shouldn't have done that. I'm so sorry, especially for those online. This is going online later, so maybe she would fix that, TR. But anyway, um, you know, the circle of life, can I just tell you, it's rooted in pagan theology. The circle of life, literally, it's rooted in this idea of reincarnation and that somehow we come back through, we've cycled over again, if you will, and the elements of our bodies are recycled at the very least, and some of it would go as far as to say that the spirit being is recycled, and today there are even Unitarian Universalists out there that are still saying some of this craziness, okay? I'm just saying. So, so but God, he never intended it to be that way. You may be like, really? I mean, death was not a part of some circle of life. Death was the penalty for sin. Death was the penalty for sin. And the effect of sin coming into the world. Listen, if Adam had not sinned, how we, we, we would have gone to heaven without dying. Now, you might say, well, how would that have worked? Well, think about this. We have a little samples of this throughout the Bible. I mean, think of Enoch in Genesis. In Hebrews chapter 11, I mean, where you just, you just go on a walk one day. Like Enoch walked with God, and then he was not. How many of you recognize that verse? And so, for God took him, and, and so Enoch is walking out the door, and his wife looks over at him and says, Hey, hey, Enoch, where are you going? Oh, I'm just going to go out on a walk for God. And he walked right into heaven. You start thinking of, I mean, Elijah. I mean, we have another example with Elijah who was walking along, and all of a sudden a chariot of fire came down, and Elijah jumps on that chariot of fire, and he went right into heaven. What a, what a crazy thought, huh? I mean, listen, if, if it hadn't been for sin, that would have been the norm. But death, because of the penalty for sin, and the reality for mankind is that, listen, we all died. I mean, so, and as a result of man's sin, the, the writer of Hebrews says it this way. He says, it's appointed in a man for him to die once, and then after that, the, the judgment. And so, again, Genesis 2.17 but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you shall not eat it. For in the day that you eat it, you shall surely die. And you may say, well, did Adam die that day? No. He lived to be 100, uh, 930 years old, the Bible says. You may say, well, what's up with that? I mean, what, what's that? Why is that? that? That verse, though, let me just tell you this. That verse tells us that while he didn't die physically, he did die. You may say, well, how so? Adam died a spiritual death that day. Adam and Eve, remember, Adam and Eve walked in the cool of the garden, the cool of the day with the Lord. Can you imagine that? I mean, Adam and Eve experienced death that day. And let me just help you process this for a second because I think sometimes we don't really think about what really death is. I mean, so, so because there, there's really three components, phases of death, if you want to look at it this way, if you will. The first one is physical death. I mean, physical death is, is that idea that there is separation from those who are living on earth. And so when someone dies, they're no longer living on earth and they're gone. There's a separation from them. Adam would physically die. And certainly there is a sense that we are all dying. And the minute you were born, death was set in. But there is a physical death. Then secondly, I want you to see there's spiritual death, which is to say that there is a, a separation from God. I mean, so, so to, to be physically dead is to really be incapable of responding or interacting with the physical world, the physical environment in which we are all living. So, well, spiritual death then is, is being incapable of being able to respond spiritually to God. So you're incapable of knowing God. 
You're incapable of sensing God. You're incapable of seeing God. And I'm not saying uh, to the nth degree, that's not to say that a person who's unsaved can't sense God at all, but it's marginal in, a, in the amount that they can. And it only, it, it's only as a result of the grace of God that's working through and trying to pierce the veil of that spiritual death to stir the heart that he might be able to become alive in Christ, that he or she might be able to do that. And the moment Adam and Eve ate the fruit, there was a separation from God. This then is the death that Paul talks about in Ephesians chapter 2. I mean, you can, that, that, that we'll look at uh, in future time, but, but when Paul writes this, that we were dead in our trespasses and our sins, you might be physically alive, but if you don't know Christ, you're spiritually dead. And so every single person, until we come to him, I mean, until we, uh, uh, until we come to him, we're, we're spiritually dead. So we're dead in our trespasses. We're dead in our sin, and, and we're incapable of responding to God spiritually outside of his grace and outside of his work in our lives. Listen, how many of you are thankful for the work of the Holy Spirit in our lives? Aren't you thankful for that? I mean, so there's a third phase of death, and that's this, eternal death. This is the one you don't want to mess with. And eternal death is to say that there is also a separation from the living, not only the living, but also from God, and that would be for forever. This is, this is eternal death. And when that person, when that happens to a person, and they are separated from the living and from God forever, they are placed in a place called hell. If you remember, God never meant man to be the affection of hell. I mean, literally, God never meant for man to be in hell. I mean, he created hell for the devil. He created it for his angels. We see that in scripture. But men and women who experience this eternal death, they're going to spend an eternity in hell. I mean, he said they'll be cast into a place of outer darkness, where they would be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Outer darkness, it's the idea that, that you literally are separated from every single person and, 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 and God as well. I mean, outer darkness. You're separated from everything good. You're separated from everything holy. You're separated from everything godly. And in, in the absence of anything good in your life, is a place called hell. Not only that, but it's not a place for you to go and party like some people believe. Well, at least all my friends will be there. No. Outer darkness and alone. Eternal death. So, 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 so this morning, here's the third handlebar. We've learned that sin entered the world through one man. We've learned that death entered the world through sin. And then thirdly, I want you to see this because all people die because all sin. And yes, by the way, if you look at this, that's sin past tense. Look at Romans chapter 5 verse 12 one more time. Therefore, just as sin came into the world through one man and death through sin. And look at this. So death spread to all men. Why? Because all sinned. Again, this, this is... This is, I say this because this is so critical to our understanding for us to have. Notice it doesn't say that all of us got a sin nature, even though, that's, even though that's true. Notice it doesn't say that we all became sinful, although generally speaking, if you and I, when we are born and we live long enough, we have the opportunity to sin. The more we, the more we actually have opportunity to sin, the more chances there are for us likely being able to sin, right? So that's true as well, but rather notice... It says, we all sinned, past tense. All, everyone, every human being sinned. You say, well, <laughs> what does that mean, Pastor Tony? It means that when Adam sinned, you and I, kind of like, how many of you have ever heard somebody say, well, before you were even a twinkle in your daddy's eye? <laughs> how many of you have ever heard somebody say that? It's kind of like that. I'm saying this because, I mean, there's so many different views we could look at, and I'm not here to come and bore you with all the views, but I just want you to see this because we were all in Adam when Adam sinned. I mean, it was, oh, certainly, listen, there was a, <laughs> you were just a twinkle in his eye when he sinned, okay, understand that, but, but you were there. All humanity was inside Adam when Adam sinned. And therefore, when he sinned, we all sinned. Secondly, I want you to see this. Adam was representative of the human race. And as such, his actions 
had a direct effect on each of us. And so he, he was, if you will, if you want to put it this way, he was acting on, on our behalf. It's not so different, really, that, that, that things could be that way. I mean, if, if you stop and think about it, we do this all the time. People use uh, representative power, uh, decision-making on, your, on our behalf. Tammy, sometimes you walk in the door, and I have empowered her to do certain things, and I've empowered TR to do I mean, we do this all the time. Uh, some of you, you, you have jobs where you're the boss, and you, you, you equip people to do things. And, and so, listen, sometimes people will act on your behalf. But listen, uh, remember the terminology we see in Scripture. He says this. He says in, in Galatians chapter 2, verse 20, I have been crucified with Christ. I, I'm in Him. I'm in Christ. That's the idea. What happened to Him? It's as if it's, it's happened to, to you and to me. I mean, we, we were in Adam. And listen, can I just tell you in Adam how devastating things were? They were so devastating. But now that we are in Christ, when through faith we believe, and it's incredibly gracious and amazing, also what happened to him, what happened to Jesus, also happened to us. And can I, can I say this? Because sometimes we, we read through verses and we th- read through Scripture and we're like, oh man, that's so neat. And I, I don't know if you understand how brilliant this is on Paul's part. This is an unbelievable juxtap- juxtaposition. It's posting something against something else. It's really cool. Because you're, you're either, here's the deal, you're either in Adam or you're in Christ. You're not both. I say this today because, just so you know, the ramifications of this are unbelievably massive. I mean, when we start looking at this and you want to start talking about the topics that are happening in our culture today, first of which, this, this passive, excuse me, this passage, it, it does something first and foremost. It proves the doctrine of original sin that is actually going by the wayside at our universities like crazy right now. Some of you are like, what do you mean? Well, I mean, original sin, the doctrine of original sin. If you look at it, it's on the board right here. Every human being is guilty of sin as a direct result of Adam's sin in the Garden of Eden. Every human being. Everybody's guilty. But what do we hear nowadays? (laughs) Oh, no, you're good enough, you're smart enough, you're great, right? Just look at yourself in the mirror and feel better about yourself, right? I mean, that's kind of what we hear. And I'm not saying, listen, can I say this? It's so important. How many of you think self-esteem is important? I think it's important. It's part of what God made us to be like. But listen, it never trumps the fact that what God says about you, no one can mess with that. So, I, you know, death spread to all men. Why? Everybody sinned. You, you were in him, in Adam. And what Adam did, when Adam did that, it, it was as if you and I sinned as well. And that's why we would say again that everybody is a sinner. I mean, you don't become a sinner when you sin. You were born a sinner. You and I were born that way. That, that's, that's why you sin. I mean, it, you don't sin because all of a sudden one day, you, oh, I fell off the, tra- the, the wagon. No, listen, you were born a sinner, and what do sinners do? They sin. I mean, so we, we come into the world that way, that, that, that little baby, sinner, baby is a sinner thing. I mean, some people are like, what in the world? I stress this because people on our day struggle more and more with this idea, but this is the clear teaching of Scripture. Remember the 200-pound baby? How many of you know what I'm re- referring to back a few weeks back? Aren't you glad babies aren't grow, are born full-grown sinners? You know what I'm saying? So listen, I, I know that's really nasty, gross. I'm so sorry. I, I saw it on this big of a screen, and when it's on this big of a screen, it's way worse. So I'm so sorry, people. I mean, so it's evidence That sin nature expressing itself in an infantile way. Now, the proof of that is, I I say this because I want to say this. This is so important for us to hear. Sometimes babies tragically die. I mean, but they don't, they didn't do anything. Maybe they didn't overtly sin or covertly sin, but, but they were born sinners. And as a result of Adam's sin, Listen, they were present in that as well. So tragically, sometimes I say this, children die. Tragically, listen, tragically, we all die. I mean, death entered the world through sin. And you're a sinner whether you feel like you're a sinner or not. And furthermore, this passage also proves, I love, I love how, how technical and how awesome God's word is. 
the more I study it, the more unbelievably true it becomes in my life. I say this because this passage proves the accuracy, the exactness, and the authenticity of the Genesis account even more so. And I say this because more and more the Genesis account is increasingly under attack. So look at it because Paul threw Adam, uh, Paul thought Adam to be an actual literal, literal person. So not allegorical, he's not some symbol of humanity for, or any of that mess. Listen, because I hear people say that, and I'm like, nope, he was a literal man, literally Adam, one person. You say, well, how do you know that? Well, look at this. I, I want you to see this because we, we see it all through Scripture, Romans chapter 5. Just in Romans, I mean, I could show you, I'm going to show you in Corinthians as well, but look at this. Look at all the places. I mean, yet death reigned from Adam to Moses. We're talking genealogically. Through one man's offense, the result of one man's sin, the result of judgment, <laughs> following one trespass because of one man's trespass. For as by the one man's disobedience. You find it echoed, 1 Corinthians. You can see it in, in chapter 15. And, and it says, for as in Adam all die, so also, look at this, in Christ shall all be made alive. I mean, what happened to him happened to you and me. Sarah, I'm going to have you guys begin to make your way back. Now, here, I'm, I'm going to say this. As you guys are making your way back, what's nuts is, and you, some of you are like, why is this so important? Why is this such a big deal? We have pr Christians, and I'm saying this, a lot, of, a lot of times what happens is we have Christians who feel the pressure to accommodate all kinds of craziness out there. We like to create hybrids because it makes us look smart, we think. The problem is, is to reject the Genesis account outright and say, well, it's an allegorical account that didn't actually happen. The problems become manifold. You may say, well, how do you mean? Well, I mean, I say that because, listen, if you can't sign on and say Genesis 1 through 3 is actually what happened, then where do you sign on? At what point do you start saying, well, the Bible's true in this regard? I mean, so then, then where do you sign on? If you can't sign on at Genesis chapter 1, then do you sign on at Genesis 3 when, when the worldwide flood happens? Well, PT, I just don't think that that could actually happen. So, you know what? You don't, you don't sign on for another several chapters. I mean, so for chapter 6, chapter 7, chapter 8, and chapter 9, so by that time you get to the Tower of Babel, and do you believe that happened? Do you believe the Tower of Babel happened then? Well, no, that's impossible. I mean, I mean God could, God, there's no way God can confuse the languages, so I'm not really sure I believe that. Well, then, at what point do you start believing what the Bible says? I say this because truth is, if you do that, you won't believe anything, will you? I say this this morning just because where do you believe and where do you not believe? And in people's ignorance, thinking that they're sophisticated, I'm saying this because they're throwing out things that will actually matter later on in the text of Scripture. So if they buy in at Abraham, on what basis did you suddenly have buy-in on Abraham that you didn't have with Genesis 1, 2, and 3? I mean, seriously, what happened in the text that make you, makes you suddenly decide that somehow that's more believable than Ab Abraham in Genesis chapter 12? So, so people adopt a, a theistic evolution, if you will, uh, and, and they teach it like they've, they know what they're talking about. And I'm sorry, this pastor, I'm just going to tell you something, just so happens to believe that what God says to be true in his word is true, and I'm going to preach it and teach it until I die. So I'm just telling you that. Certainly, certainly as a rule of thumb, you have different rules for hermeneutics and books and different books. I understand that. But here's the real problem with the allegorical talk in Genesis chapter 1, 2, and 3. Let me just get to this. If you say that Adam was not a man, then what do you say about Christ? Did one man die for our sin? I mean, did when, when, do, you, when do you buy in and when do you not buy in? I say this because Paul view, views them as both human people and both as individuals. And if you don't believe there was a literal Adam and what Paul says about them to be true, then you have to go back and you have to say, then why is there really even any need for salvation? I mean, why is there really any need for forgiveness? If, if Adam wasn't real, how do we know Jesus was real? I mean, that's what people start doing. And if, if one man's sin wasn't real, I mean, then how do we know that one man's sacrifice was enough for sacrifice for all of humanity listen you simply just cannot have it both ways the bible teaches that death is the result of sin 
But if you embrace stuff like this, then what you knowing, unknowingly do is you, here's what happens, and people don't think things through sometimes. What unknowingly happens, if you embrace a theistic evolution, then what you unknowingly do is you make God the author of something that God was ne- had never authored. God is not the author of suffering and death. I say this, I mean, didn't, didn't think about that, huh? I'm saying this because and that's not what the Bible teaches at all. But which calls into question God's ability to look at creation and say, it's good. One part affects the other. Really, I'm, I'm saying this because how, how many of you think, how many of you are like, man, I just want to follow Jesus. I want to follow, I want to follow the, the God of the Bible. I want to follow him in every single way. How many of you would say, man, that's me today? I want to follow Jesus. I want to follow his word. I want to follow, I believe what he says in his book to be true, and I'm going to do that. I'm going to follow him all the days of my life. That's, that's my heart. That's my heart for God's people, is that in a day where people question the Bible more and more, that you and I would be people who stand on the foundations of its, of its word. And, and I'm just saying, God, God's word is so true and so powerful and so faithful. I just love God's word, don't you? So, listen, Jesus Christ, he overcame the grave. And because he overcame the grave, you and I can overcome the grave. I think that's deserving of a real serious hand clap right there. I'm just saying, I'm saying, I, I, he overcame the grave. I mean, I could go into stuff about science. I'm saying this because, I, listen, we have this thing with science nowadays that science has replaced theology. hundred years ago, theology was queen bee. Today, science is. And I'm just going to help you with something here real quick. I'm not against science. How many of you think it's important that we actually study things and learn things? And How many think it's important that we learn? I mean, I'm, I, I think it's important that we learn, but here's the deal. One example of science can't possibly be God is this. As recently as the 1990s, science thought that gravity was slowing down the expansion of the universe. And therefore, it was creating these variety of theorems. I mean, so on the creation of planets, black holes, and all the like. I mean, you, I don't know if you, some of you remember that back in the 90s. There was a lot of talk. And so all of these different things that were coming up. And so science was saying, this is fact. When in fact, now... What we actually know is that gravity is not slowing down the expansion of the universe, but in fact, the opposite is actually happening. That's, that's what's happening. So the universe is speeding up in its, in its expansion. So you tell me, so scientific fact change? Come on, God's people. I'm just saying. So scientific fact changed? Maybe we didn't know everything there is to know like God knows. So, and people are relying on this stuff. Science, I'm just saying. (laughs) Poor Pluto. I'm so, I feel so sorry for Pluto. I really do. I feel sorry for Pluto because kind of Pluto's in, Pluto's out. Pluto's in, Pluto's out. You know, (laughs) that's a joke, but it was a planet, then it wasn't. Which one is it, right? So this, this goes through the whole of a lot of different areas. I mean, you can go through medical science, you can go through all these different places. I'm just saying, I am so thankful for the word of God. And so, please understand me. I'm not arguing that we do away with science or anything like that. I respect that. But listen, I am strongly advising this. This is where the rubber meets the road this morning. For you as a follower of Jesus, that you don't come to a place that you have more faith in science than you do the Word of God. Like, can I tell you that would be tragedy? Because of all the people in the entire world that knows what's going on, guess who knows what's going on? He's the alpha and he's the omega. He's the beginning and the end. He stands outside of time. He knows what decisions you'll make. That's, that's, that's mind-boggling for some people. And I'm just telling you, God is that big. He's that great. He's that awesome. So I feel like I should be getting more amens when I say stuff like that. But I'm just saying, I know the room is a little less packed this morning, so I'm trying to, trying to wrestle through that. So how many of you are here this morning and you'd say, man, God is my everything. He's awesome. He's my all in all. How many of you would say that this morning? I want you to stand right now, right where you're at. Can we do this before we go? I want to do this because... (laughs) Our God is incredible. 
I, I can't help but look at it and think, man, look at God's word and think, man, God longs for a relationship with me. The God that created all of this longs for a relationship. He, he, he wants that relationship with you and I. He chooses to have a relationship with us. It's amazing. I, I just want to do this this morning. I want you right now, right where you're at, I want you just to respond to that. I want you to think about this. The God that measured the expanses of the sky from pinky to thumb, the Bible says, he also is aware that you and I are where we are and what we are and who we are. And he has the hairs on our head numbered. Think about that for a minute. minute. Can I just say something? You don't even do that. Some of you, it wouldn't be as hard, Chad. But I'm just saying. I mean, he shaves it. He, he's not bald. He's just shaving it. So I'm just saying, like, some of, it would, some of us, it wouldn't be that much work to do that on. But listen, we don't even do that for ourselves, and, but yet God knows that. Man, I don't love myself that much. I'm not going to sit there and try that, even though it wouldn't take as long as some of you. I don't have time for that. But it makes me long for his presence and makes me want to worship him all the more because he actually loves and he cares about me even though he's got so much greater things to be worried about and to be dealing with, he chooses to actually be concerned about me. And I'm telling you right now, that makes me just say, wow, our God is actually unbelievably awesome. So I want you to do something right now. I want you just right where you're at, I want you just to express worship to God, pure worship right now. You guys can begin to sing that song if you want, but I just want you just to begin to express pure worship to God and just thank Him for who He is, what He is, everything about Him. Thank you. Thank you, God, for Your Word. Thank you, God, for whatever it might be this morning. This morning, we thank you, God. We worship you, God. You are so awesome. There is none like you, Jesus. Yeah, let's sing that together. Such an awesome God, so selfless, so generous, so faithful you are. Such an awesome God. God, we worship so you. Mighty, Thank you, God. Lord, you're so good. So wonderful, such an awesome God, so selfless, so generous, so faithful you are, such an awesome God, so praise you, God. Thank you, God. Praise you, God. Lord, we just give you praise in this place, Lord God. Lord, we recognize your awesome greatness, oh God. Lord, we recognize that, Lord, that you are full of infinite wisdom. Lord, we thank you that, Lord God, that you loved us so much that you left your post. Lord, that you came to be around people like us, broken people. God, thank you for sending your son to die on the cross. We thank you that, Lord, that the truth of your word, Lord, it can permeate in our hearts, and Lord, it can dwell deeply and richly. Lord, I pray that it would do that among your people, God, as we walk out of this place today. Lord God, we ask that, Lord, that we would be more in love with you and your word than we ever have in all of our lives, oh God. God, increase that relationship there. Help it on our part. Lord, you, 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 you've removed the You've removed the wall. That wall of partition is gone now. So, Lord, we have access to you. And so pray, God, today that your people would see the need for that access to be utilized, oh God. 
we hunger and we thirst after you. We thank you and we love you. I want us to do something right now. Heads bowed, eyes closed. I want you just to respond to the Lord. How many of you would say today, man, (laughs) there are moments where I feel that my relationship with the Lord is waning where it's not where it should be, where it's, I I feel like I put God off some and there's times when I put God off to the side and maybe he's the last thing I end up doing when I go to bed and sometimes I, I'm, I fall asleep or, I mean, you could, you could, we, we can put God last sometimes in our relationship to him. You're here this morning, you'd say, man, I find myself doing that. I find myself I want to repent for that today. You'd say, that's me today. You'd just slip your hand right up where you're at. Relationship to God, relationship to his word, the relationship to being faithful to him and, and following him all the days of your life. I mean, I know that that's a, that's a longed for thing among God's people, but right now his heads are, heads are bowed and eyes are closed and hands are lifted today. I just want you just to lift the other hand and God, I just worship you and I just thank you. And Lord, I, I commit myself, Lord God, I commit myself to to place you in the premier place. I commit myself to putting you first. That, Lord, that Matthew 6.33 would truly be true in my life. That I would seek first the kingdom of God and your righteousness. And then, Lord, let you take care of the rest. (laughs) Then all these other things. The things that the birds of the air don't even think about. The things that they neither toil nor spend. All those things on the side, Lord. The provision. Lord God, you will take care of the rest, Lord. Our job is just to seek you first and put you first. I pray that you would help your people to be about that. As we walk out these doors, may that be resolute in our hearts, oh God. We love you. We thank you. And we bless your holy name. In Jesus' awesome name. All God's people this morning said, amen. Let's give God one great round of applause before we go. Thank you, Jesus. Before we go, there, there may be those that are in this place, and maybe you're here today. Um, you, you want a relationship with the Lord. I would encourage you to do something. Right now, I've got a, we got a team of people. I want you to raise your hand if you're on the team of people that actually pray with people afterwards. Raise your hand real high. Okay, look around real quick. If, if you need someone to pray with you, I'd be more than happy to pray with you, but there's, there's a team of people that actually are available, and we would love to uh, help you begin a relationship with Jesus Christ who is more awesome than anything that I could ever just talk about just a moment ago. I, well, I, I don't do it justice. I'm just telling you he's, he's that great. So, but God is awesome, and, I, and I'm trusting that God would work in that process that you guys could lead people to Jesus. How many of you know that other people can lead people to Jesus besides the pastor? How many of you know that? We've, we've trained that. So I'm just telling you, that's your job. That's part of my job is to equip you and to train you and to help you do that. So, but God bless you. Have a wonderful day in Jesus Christ. God bless you and have a great day.